Welcome market participants. Another three things in credit. I'm Van Hesser, Chief Strategist at KBRA. Each week we bring you three things impacting credit markets that we think you should know about. Now we're back and very much looking forward to a rollicking fourth quarter. To take us out, we saw this bit from Aaron Brown, former head of financial market research at AQR. When future economic historians write of our times, he said, the thrust will be that it was a time of transition. Generational changes are taking place in labor markets. Rapidly changing technology threatens to disrupt everything. There's a strong political push to restructure the energy sector for environmental reasons. And we face unprecedented peacetime fiscal imbalances and an exceptionally fluid international situation. So, a few things to ponder as you power through the new issue deluge. This week, our three things are, one, tightening financial conditions. It's been slow in coming, but it's here. Two, investment grade credit spreads. They've held in because they should. And three, consumer sentiment. How useful is it in determining consumer spend? All right, let's dig a bit deeper. Tightening financial conditions. In some respects, financial conditions, the thing the Fed has been diligently trying to tighten in order to slow the economy, in order to tame inflation, had not been cooperating. Measures of said had actually been loosening as the soft landing narrative increasingly became more mainstream. But the times, they are a change in. Financial conditions measures are now mixed. Bloomberg's and the Chicago Fed's are still improving, while Goldman's is getting worse. We're in the Goldman camp. Think about changes that are afoot. Rates have risen smartly, the 10-year hitting the highest level since 2007. Higher rates, of course, mechanically undermine equity values. And although credit spreads remain tight, bank loan underwriting standards have tightened considerably. And taken together, we've got themes we've talked about quite a bit in the past, namely a higher cost of capital that's holding back business capex and higher cost of borrowing and a negative wealth effect is affecting consumer spending. Now throw into the mix higher energy costs. West Texas oil up 27% since the beginning of May and natural gas up 20%. That's going to lean on corporate margins and consumer disposable income. And let's not forget the higher U.S. dollar, which will reduce demand for exports. So all of this is leaving a mark on demand, which is the point. But no one should be all that worried about the inevitable overshoot of higher for longer than necessary. As we have said all along, the economy is not all that off kilter. It is correcting. Moreover, uncertainty is not all that pronounced. We know what the problem is, and we know how to fix it. And that fix is well on course. This is what normal looks like. All right, on to our second thing. Magnitude matters. We find ourselves often having to explain how you can have investment grade spreads at non-recession levels in a recession sounds like a brain teaser, or at least something that is nonsensical. It's really not. But it is a reminder that magnitude matters. Magnitude of the contraction. At the risk of stating the obvious, economic contractions raise default risk and liquidity risk, two things credit investors care deeply about. How investors react depends on the level of uncertainty surrounding the former default risk, as liquidity risk will be a second order effect. So in a downturn, spreads widen. But to what extent? Well, that'll be a function of how investors with different mandates interpret forward risk. For buy and hold investors, confidence around just how money good a particular credit is, or whether or not it can remain on the right side of popular breakpoints, such as investment grade, will help determine how much spread widening is likely to happen. Total return investors, of course, will want to take into consideration technical factors that affect liquidity, such as structure and the size of market. So determining fair value and spread widening ultimately is a bit of art and science. Now in a mild contraction, say 1% quarter on quarter for a relatively short duration, say two quarters, demand for safety and liquidity will certainly rise. Investor interest naturally skews towards safer credit quality in simpler structures and large markets. Investors trade up in quality, up in liquidity, and up in simplicity. And given the magnitude of what investors think the contraction is shaping up to be, and in our current situation, a mild contraction, we're not likely to see demand weaken materially as these credits, by definition, 
should be easily able to ride out the downturn. And sure enough, in our current environment, where a soft landing narrative has taken hold, IG spreads have held in well. Sure, piercing 150 basis points here and there over the past couple of years, but in general, they've held in well. In a more severe recession with plenty of uncertainty and questions of financial stability, think global financial crisis, there's going to be much more selling pressure across the credit spectrum. Now, for context, recall that annualized real GDP growth in the U.S. during the crisis was negative in five of six quarters stretching from 2008 to the first half of 2009, including meltdown quarters of 8.5% and 4.6% in the fourth quarter of 2008 and the first quarter of 2009, respectively. So no great surprise that IG spreads hit a wide of 618 basis points in December of 2008. Now, pulling all this together as we head into rising economic headwinds, you can make the case that the bid for safe, durable, liquid bonds will increase, especially if competing asset classes have more uncertainty. There, we see the rates market wrestling with the extent to which the Fed will intervene in markets to tame inflation. Certainly plenty of uncertainty there. How about stocks? Well, current multiples are full and fair to say the least, and most street strategists see selling pressure into year end. All of a sudden, IG yields close to 6% for the index and meaningfully higher if you can take some liquidity and structural complexity doesn't look so bad. Put simply, in this kind of environment with a manageable contraction looming, IG figures to retain its relatively strong bid. We see weakness only in the riskiest and structurally more complex segments of the market. All right, on to our third thing, consumer sentiment. We ran across a fascinating piece in The Economist this week that gets at one of the great dislocations in the pandemic era. Why consumer sentiment is measured by the longest-running survey, that conducted by the University of Michigan, has not squared up with current and projected consumer spending. For decades, it has. But in the pandemic, that survey quickly tumbled, hitting its lowest point ever in June of 2022. Meanwhile, consumer spending fueled by unprecedented helicopter money and a tight jobs market, quickly rebounded upon the economic reopening back to trend levels. The gap between the two, sentiment and spending, completely broke down. The Economist built its own model of 13 variables, including the usual suspects of inflation, unemployment, and gas prices. That model explained a high 86% of the pre-pandemic variation in its consumer sentiment model. But COVID made the model's projection quote, wildly, unquote, inaccurate. In the past, we've highlighted the disconnect, hypothesizing that concerns or frustrations about non-economic factors were creeping into the survey. Things like political dysfunction, social media effects, and breakdowns in trust of institutions. We saw and continue to see plenty of evidence of that when you look at surveys asking whether or not we are happy or on the right track as a country. There's plenty of dissatisfaction out there. And we've long thought that those developments affected the sentiment data. We also recognize that there's a powerful divergence happening in the U.S. between the relatively well-off financially and the 60% of households that live paycheck to paycheck. The Economist study concludes in a very unsatisfying way, claiming that the correlation between sentiment and both current and projected spending has vanished. The Pyrrhic victory, according to the paper, is that what it calls bad vibes does not suggest that a recession is coming. That's helpful, I guess. So there you have it. Three things in credit. One, tightening financial conditions. The shakeout is coming. Two, IG credit spreads. Spreads should hold in, given what we see. And three, consumer sentiment. It covers more today than just willingness to spend. As always, thanks for joining Don't forget to check in on KBRA.com for our latest research and ratings reports. See you next week. Hello, listeners. Join me, Van Hesser, KBRA's chief strategist for in-depth conversations with credit experts in my new monthly podcast, Leading Voices in Credit, where I'll interview market professionals on the latest trends in credit markets. That's Leading Voices in Credit with Van Hesser. Subscribe now.